Hello and welcome to Unquire. We are looking at music for this coming Sunday, our fifth Sunday in Lent. And uh, at Christ the King, we are going to be exploring a new hymn that I'm rather excited about. Uh, as many of you may know or may not know, I'm a gardener and uh, I usually start plants from seed. Uh, most of my vegetables, not everything of course, but a, a few things. And in the last week I've started um, starting some seedlings. Um, so I have a, so some tiny little broccoli coming and some tiny little cauliflower and a couple other things. Um, we have some gardening imagery in the gospel for Sunday. Christ says that, uh, likens sort of the kingdom of God to the process of a seed. It falls to the earth, it's sort of entombed in the earth, it looks like it, it died, but it, it's full of life and it's going to rise and burst into something that we can't even imagine. So I've always liked that imagery um, and it's spoken to me and uh, as people that uh, eat the produce of the earth, um, it's good to think about some of those images in different ways before they meet our plate. Um, Seed That in Earth is Dying is a new hymn. Uh, it's found in the ELW, if you happen to have that, at 330, 330. And uh, before we get into that, which will be our hymn of the day, uh, I wanted to think about sort of singing the faith and how singing is a formative experience. <clears throat> I'm only going to bring us through two pieces of music tonight because I wanted to talk about um, the hymn of the day. And we use that term in the Lutheran Church for, um, we have used it for a long time, and, uh, but there's probably many amongst us that don't really understand. I mean, we have an idea of what it is, but um, the whole concept and how that came to be. So I thought I'd, I'd flesh that out a little bit. So a little bit of history, um, a little bit of liturgical formation here. Uh, as we worship together, we are formed in our faith. And the hymn of the day is supposed to be the hymn that sets the tone. It's the primary hymn of the service. And uh, from the earliest days in the Lutheran Church, uh, whether it's formally been called the hymn of the day or not, it has existed. Um, Luther, in reforming worship and casting it in ways that uh, were more conducive to the forming the faith of people, um, in his particular context there in Germany in the 1500s, uh, was building upon actually a phenomenon that happened a little bit earlier in the medieval church. Um, uh, between the reading, there was only one reading, uh, and the gospel, uh, there was a piece of music, and it was called the gradual. And historically, it was a psalm or built on the psalms, one of the psalms that connected best to those readings and sort of bridged that and helped complete the theme. And it usually had a refrain or something that... Um, a larger choir or the congregation um, or uh, the clergy, uh, monastic community, whomever happened to be present and was sort of versed in that that tradition um, and, and, and knew the music could join in on. So we might understand that better today as sort of the, the model of a responsorial psalm, right? Or um, something that has a simple refrain that comes back. That's where the seed <laughs> for this uh, f seed of faith came from. And what he did is took a lot of those ideas, and there were a good uh, chunk of Latin hymns um, from the, the church that uh, explored themes of the season, the Gospels, um, especially the, the, the bigger uh, Lent, Advent, those bigger seasons of the church, um, and built upon them. <clears throat> and those became the chorales that we know so often, and the... Uh, he elevated one of them and said, one of these should be the hymn of the day. And the same way that the gradual sort of functioned in the mass, uh, we're going to call it the hymn of the day. And this is something that will help form the faith of the people and give the people a voice in sort of preaching and contemplating and living with and living into the readings of uh, the worship Sunday morning experience. So that's sort of the idea of where the hymn of the day came from. And that, that term was kind of lost a little bit, but um, sometimes they use the term pulpit hymn or gradual hymn or something of that nature. Um, but it was always sort of there and connected. <clears throat> and sometimes it was sung right after the gospel and before the sermon. Sometimes it was sung after the sermon. Uh, we typically sing it after the sermon. 
And one thing I read that I found was interesting was that the hymn of the day lets poets speak and interpret the scripture. And I think that's valuable too, because we have the scriptures that preach from themselves, the prophets and um, the apostles in their writings. Um, we hear from Jesus himself in the gospel. Uh, we hear from our local preacher um, or preachers, whomever they might be, as their take on it. Uh, and collectively, we sort of uh, voice our, our, our faith and our response to that in the creed and the prayers. But poets are allowed to speak as well, and artists. Um, and I think that's a wonderful thing that should be celebrated and valued, especially when we think about the hymns of the church, and specifically the hymn of the day, and saying everybody has a voice in this process of forming and leading and interpreting our faith. So that's a little history on the hymn of the day, maybe more than you ever wanted. Uh, our hymn of the day for Sunday is Seed That in Earth is Dying. This is a hymn uh, from Scandinavia, and it has found its way into a few hymnals, and this is the first uh, hymnal that, uh, Lutheran hymnal in North America that's published it. It uh, comes from the pen of Svein Ellingsen. He was born in 1929 and actually died last year in 2020. <clears throat> Excuse me. He was a Norwegian visual artist and a hymnist, uh, wrote hymn texts. He is the author of poetry and children's books as well. And he was actually made um, for his artistic merits uh, a knight of the Order of St. Olaf, um, which I didn't know anything about, <laughs> but apparently the same way that the Queen of England has knighted Elton John and other poets and artists, um, the King of Norway um, has a similar order and knighted Svein, who wrote our text. Uh, the tune actually comes from Harold Heriththal, and he was born in 1944. He's a professor of church music at the State Music Academy uh, in Norway, and he's an organist and a teacher. Um, music reviewer, and has been very active on the Norwegian music scene since the 1970s. Uh, the tune is very easy to sing, and it supports the text very well. Um, and the text in English has a nice rhythm to it as, uh, as well. The tune sounds like this. <laughs> To it, and I love that upward leap, bum 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 bum, just like a plant sort of springing up. We have that pattern over and over again. Um, I'll sing through the text once, but first I will speak it to you. Seed that in earth is dying grows into ears of grain. Grapes that are crushed in the vessel turn into golden wine. God, through this mystery, grant us. Faith in our deepest darkness, life in our night and death. We were baptized in Jesus, into his death and grave. Two resurrections promise, praise and eternal life. Heaven's own praises begin here, where you yourself are near us, deep in our night and death. I think this text is wonderful as well because it celebrates what happens in the dark or behind the scenes. Uh, so many of our texts celebrate what happens in the light, and there's obviously activity and growth happening in darker seasons um, and in uh, shallow graves and places where seeds are buried. Um, there's always a spark of life there. <clears throat> the text goes on and concludes with, Seed that in earth is dying, rises to bear much fruit. Christ, as we meet at your table, give us the bread of life. Lord, we do thank and adore you. Unceasing praise of the ages rises from night and death. 
let's put that together and you can listen and uh, you'll be ready to sing along on Sunday. Seed That in Earth is Dying, our hymn of the day for Sunday. Welcome, Sandy. Thanks for joining us. Our next hymn that we'll look at is O Master, Let Me Walk With You. If you have a hymnal at home, it is 818 in our uh, current ELW hymnal. And if you have the older LBW hymnal, it's 492 in there. Again, 818 in the red, 492 in the old green. <clears throat> uh, I thought I knew a little bit about this tune, but in uh, doing some research, I realized I didn't know a lot about the tune or the text. Um, the tune comes to us from the Victorian era. It was written by uh, a man called Percy Smith, and he was an organist in England. Uh, he died in 1898. And it was written for a different text. However, the author of uh, our text, O Master, Let Me Walk With You, specifically wanted uh, his new words sung to this tune. So that's why it's always, at least in the United States and Canada, been paired with this. Uh, in the British Isles, they, they often sing it to a different tune. Um, but the author was American and had a lot of sway um, when the text was published. He also happened to be a um, on a hymn hymnal editing board, so um, maybe his voice was a little bit more prominent and present than many other poets who don't get the chance to decide what tunes maybe their, their text will be sung to. O Master, Let Me Walk With You was written by a man called Washington Gladden, and he was a congregational minister, and he served, um, well actually he was born in 1838 and died um, shortly after World War I. He was a distinguished clergyman um, of his time. He was a leader in the new social gospel movement. And if you remember or have heard um, that, that before, um, that, that concept before, uh, that was taking sort of the gospel to the streets in a way that was tangible and present. Um, that it was not only people's um, souls that they were trying to touch, but their lives and their bodies and their minds. Um, 
taking very literally um, the text from James that uh, faith without works is dead, uh, they said we need to embody our faith. And uh, there were a lot of other movements that sort of crisscrossed with uh, social gospel in Christianity. <clears throat> there were a lot of early feminists uh, that were proponents of that, uh, the labor movement. There were a lot of uh, things as far as organizing society in ways that were just and fair and equitable um, and saying that we stand up for that as a church. Um, now, there were very many other people that said that has nothing to do with Christianity um, and you're all heretics. Um, but he was a proponent of the social gospel movement. And he was, uh, as I said, very well known in his day. He preached to uh, auditori auditoriums of thousands. He was also a guest lecturer at a lot of universities, including Yale. <clears throat> Uh, he wrote this text, um, and it's uh, originally had a stanza that I'll read to you in a second here that wasn't included, and I found a story that connects with that, but I'll just read the text to you as poetry, as it stands in our hymnal. O Master, let me walk with you in lowly paths of service true. Tell me your secret, help me bear the strain of toil, the fret of care. Help me the slow of heart to move by some clear winning word of love. Teach me the wayward feet to stay and guide them in the homeward way. Teach me your patience, share with me a closer, dearer company in work that keeps faith sweet and strong, in trust that triumphs over wrong, in hope that sends a shining ray far down the future broadening way, in peace that only you can give, with you, O Master, let me live. Uh, so many hymns address uh, Christ as Lord or Savior. Here we're using the term Master, um, and I think because we have the idea of teaching, he wanted that sort of master pupil, um, the, uh, sitting at the feet of the rabbi sort of uh, concept um, in the language as he crafted this. Uh, as I said, there was always this tension, um, at least in the uh, late 1800s, between uh, what became known as the social gospel and uh, very sort of traditionalists in the church, um, churches, uh, that sort of split. And we had this sort of group that became um, what were called sort of... Uh, you know, sort of the fundamentalist Christian churches that said everything written in the Bible is absolutely true, whether it's talking about faith or science um, or history, um, perhaps a scary thought for many of us. Um, and those that said the Bible is true, yes, but it's more poetry and speaking to the spirit and faith and it shouldn't be treated like a science book um, or a history book of the world. <clears throat> And so the social gospel folk definitely fit more in the, the, uh, the, the latter group there. Um, and so there was tension in at least the congregational church at that time. And uh, there were heresy trials and all kinds of things with different ministers uh, being thrown out of the church for what they said. There is an interesting stanza. This was written in a newspaper as just sort of a, a devotional piece, a Christian newspaper. And there's a missing stanza. And in the midst of the sort of this text that celebrates learning from Christ and embodying the gospel and reaching out to others um, on a human level, <clears throat> this stanza was never, it was published and part of the, uh, the poetry, but obviously never found its way into a hymn book. O oh, Master, let me walk with thee before the taunting Pharisee. Help me to bear the sting of spite the hate of those who hide thy light, the sore distrust of souls sincere who cannot read thy judgments clear, the dullness of the multitude who dimly guess that thou art good. So there he's definitely speaking to um, what he would see as the Pharisees uh, in, in his profession that said that uh, you should be preaching and saving souls and not worrying about all these other things. <clears throat> he uh, was a, a large proponent of working with both uh, labor and the employers of his day um, and wanted them to talk to each other and 
uh, learn from each other and support one another as co-partners instead of using <laughs> each other. And uh, several of his uh, critics said that his job was, quote, to save souls and not to regulate business, end quote, and that he challenged the idea um, that Christianity had nothing to do with one's daily life Monday through Saturday, um, and it was pretty much a Sunday-focused only uh, concept. Uh, he found many of his fellow clergymen, um, frankly, a little cowardly for not standing up for their true beliefs um, and sort of acquiescing to the critics amongst them. And uh, after a while, uh, he became a little bit more dissatisfied, but uh, eventually, if you study history, um, there were more churches that sort of followed <laughs> that sway than um, sort of went down that sort of uh, fundamentalist route. <clears throat> This hymn is kind of a paradox, though, because it has sort of this very sweet text and this very sweet tune that's paired with it as well. And you wouldn't think that this was written by the pen of sort of a uh, pioneering social justice guy. Um, it seems very quintessentially Victorian. And that's one reason I wanted to share this, the uh, story with you as well. The postlude you'll hear on Sunday is based on this tune, Oh Master, Let Me Walk With You. So we won't be singing this text, but you'll definitely be hearing it. Hi, Bonnie. Welcome. And uh, I'll sing through it as our final song for tonight. songs, the seeds of faith, as it were. And uh, as we sing through these texts and uh, listen to their, their melodies that are associated with them, uh, let's find faith growing in, in unexpected places this week in our lives. Thanks for joining us. See you next week. <laughs>